Hello, Tech fans, and welcome in to another edition of the Tech Sideline Podcast, originating from TSL's High Tech Studios in the Virginia Tech Corporate Research Center. Whether you're watching or listening, live or archived, we're so glad that you could join us today on Wednesday, November 20th, and preview what is going to be a big one in the Coastal this weekend at Lane Stadium, 7-3 and three, Pittsburgh, 7-3 and three, Virginia Tech. We've got our new normal crew, as always, today behind the scenes producing. We've got Malcolm Stewart on the podcast set, our Managing Editor Chris Coleman, our founder and head honcho Will Stewart. I'm your podcast host, Evan Hughes. We're ready to rock and roll live on the Tech Sideline podcast. Again, recording on Wednesday morning, November the 20th. A reminder that this week and every week, the Tech Sideline podcast is presented by the Fisher Law Firm, Virginia's trusted DUI and traffic defense firm dedicated to defending individuals charged with traffic-related offenses. From their offices in Blacksburg and Roanoke, the Fisher Law Firm handles cases throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. To date, the firm has defended more than 30,000 people charged with moving violations. For free consultation, call anytime, day or evening, toll free at 1-800-680-7031. That number one more time, one 800 680 Six eight zero seven zero three one, or you can email them at info at fisherlegal dot com. Gentlemen, good morning. How's everyone doing today on this uh, chilly, but not too chilly day in Blacksburg? Uh, doing well. I think we have Will Cam back. Malcolm, can you verify? I got to do my point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, doing well. What about you? Things are going well. CC, what's happening? Nothing. I'm good. Let's roll. Okay, let's roll. Hey, you heard it right there. Uh, let's dive right into it. As, as I said, it is a it's a busy week here uh, for Virginia Tech as the Hokies take on the Pittsburgh ACC Coastal Hopes Alive, Charlotte, uh, the game in Charlotte, the ACC Championship, Clemson's on the line, the Orange Bowl, everything, all the marbles are on the line this week. What we'll do on the podcast, we'll talk a little bit about Virginia Tech. We'll spend the majority of the time talking about Pittsburgh, and then we'll spend a good amount of time getting to everyone's questions on Facebook Live. Again, Feel free to drop those now for those that are watching live. Malcolm will take them down. We'll get to them at the end of the podcast. Um, so can I jump in here? Absolutely. You, were, you were talking about everything that's on the line, and I'm, I'm perturbed by the focus police showing up and telling everybody to focus on Pitt. Because um, there's been discussion of the Orange Bowl, discussion of the Virginia game. It's all part of the same pot. You know, right. I mean, just because somebody's talking about the Orange Bowl and talking about Virginia doesn't mean they're not thinking about Pitt. And fans don't matter anyway. Let's get that out of the way. <laughs> yeah. you know? you can th- you're a fan. You can think about whatever you want. You can That's think about right. next year's Penn State game, and it won't have an impact on this coming week. Yeah, game, I mean, so this, this is – this is it, it's all the same thing. Virginia Tech has, has had, a, had a great turnaround of the season to put themselves in position mm-hmm. to have a big game this Saturday – have another big game next Saturday, and then maybe, you know, just more and more big games. It's all part of the same thing. It's got nothing to do with focusing on Pitt. I'm going to ask you guys a question that uh, obviously the coaches are not concerned about this at all. And, of course, at, at this point in the season, what Tech has on the line, this part does not matter. But I think it's an interesting way to open up the podcast because it's something that fans get to talk about. And that uh, are, are the rankings that came up. Virginia Tech is back in the AP Top 25 poll at 25 they're not in the coaches' poll, and they were not in the initial top 25 rankings of the college football playoff that came out on Tuesday night. Frank must not have, not have taken enough people out for drinks, man. <laughs> <Gosh>. Frank, <laughs> come on, man. Come on, Frank. Here's what I'm going to ask you guys. I know rankings don't matter. I'm going to ask you this. Is Virginia Tech a top 25 team in the country right now? I think so. I mean, they certainly look like it. You know, uh, uh, I think a lot of fans equate being ranked with being a really, really good team. No, there's – there's very few teams in college football that don't have flaws, you know. Uh, um, and we've been talking about this. Chris has been talking about this a lot lately. When you look around the coastal, you talk about playing Pitt, you talk about playing Virginia. Those are teams with with big gaps in in and when we'll get into Pitt here soon and, and kind of tell you where they're where they're good and where they're not good. Just because you're ranked doesn't mean you know you're, you're you're a great team. Virginia Tech's a very good team right now. I think. I th- I think they're right about where they belong. Fringe top twenty five, uh, maybe better. We'll find out in the next two weeks. Um, yeah, good question. Do you know who off the top of your head who the last five teams are in the rankings? Give me one second. Okay. Um, I just I saw don't. it. Uh, the yeah. top twenty five in the college football playoff rankings, correct? Uh, twenty five is SMU. Twenty four is App State. Twenty three is USC Southern Cal. Twenty two is Iowa State. Twenty one is Oklahoma State. I've I've seen. USC play once. Now, granted, it was against Oregon, right. but they got hammered, and they seem like they just laid down and quit. And I watched that game in, in a bar in South Bend after the Tech Notre Dame game. 
and Notre Dame games were very Notre Dame fans were very happy with that result. So, just from what I've seen with my own eyes, I don't view them as a top twenty-five team. But at the same time, that's the only time I've seen them, um, and that's the problem with rankings is uh, m- most people who do the rankings don't actually watch the teams play. Uh, yeah. So uh, like, you can't. I mean, there's not enough hours. Yeah, in there's the not day. enough hours in the day. I mean, I think Tech. You could make, certainly make an argument for putting Tech in it. You could probably make an argument for leaving them out. Um, I guess teams like SMU and App State, they have one loss, I assume. Um, you know, their schedules aren't as difficult but, uh, because they play in smaller leagues. But at the same time, they've done very, very, very well against the schedule they were given. Uh, I think Tech is a complete team as far as they're good in all three phases. Right. Um, so they didn't I, say great. Tech's but, good. But good. Tech's good in all three yeah, phases. Yeah, but they're good, in all, they're good in all three phases. And being ranked in college football doesn't mean as much as being ranked in college basketball. All right, there, there are about 130 FBS teams. So approximately one out of every five teams is ranked. Solid point. Uh, in college basketball, you have 350 Division I teams. There, there, there's not an F, FBS-FCS divide. So when you're ranked in the top 25, you're one of the top 8%, 7%, something like that. I mean, you're in a pretty yeah, you're yeah. you're in a pretty elite percentile. Yeah. So being ranked like 25th in basketball is is like being ranked 10th in football or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, you know, to me, I think Tech probably is a top 25 team, but Clearly, they won't be if they don't win on Saturday. You know, it's a really good, really good point. And speaking of which, on uh, side note, college basketball uh, rankings, Tech is receiving votes right now in the top twenty-five poll. But that's a discussion for a uh, another <laughs> no time. Kidding. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, right. I, 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 I'm I'm in no way trying to compare Mike Young to James Johnson. Right. But James Johnson's first year as Virginia Tech's head, head Start coach, eight and zero, right? Seven and zero or eight and zero, something like that. They were first receiving votes. They were ranked twenty-six in the country. Mm-hmm. Went to West Virginia, lost a really close game. Then they won one, and they were eight and one or nine and one, and then they ended up winning like twelve games the whole year. They were awful. Oh, I thought you were going to say the next two years. <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> it pretty felt close, like that. Uh, right? Yeah. Um, so just don't worry about things right now, right. man. Don't worry about rankings. Don't worry about records. You mean you're? T- we're talking about basketball. We're talking about right? basketball. Okay. Right. Just, just worry about two years from now. <laughs> Let me, I'll, I'll I'll bring it back to the football discussion. Kind of kind of going on with the rankings. I don't know if you guys watch uh, Packer and Durham at all or listen to their. Uh, uh, sometimes I don't get a chance to watch them as much as I'd like. I, I'm the same way. I, I pulled up their show um, on Monday because I, I really like their segment when they do uh, accounting, but the ACC is in all caps. Is they do their power right? rankings, mm-hmm. um, and basically, Wes has Virginia Tech at two, and Packers got Tech at four. Uh, there's a little bit of um, and who does he have in front of Tech? Packard? He's got UVA at two, and then he's got Pittsburgh at three. Still well, hang, well, West in. West took a lot of uh, heat. He did for when he had Tech eleventh that week, and and he didn't right, move him like up two after. Weeks ago. Yeah, and he has admitted he was actually joking on the show. He's like, listen, Hokie fans are going to be. In. He was saying his Twitter handle because they're like Hokie fans are going to be in his mentions. Right. I'm not bringing that up to talk about uh, what they have. What just of what I'm bringing up though is that Packer was talking about just how much basically a coin flip the Coastal is, and there's no real formula to pick who the better ones are. But he kept saying the thing about Tech is I can't get over that 45-10 loss to Right, Duke. absolutely. Well, so if you're that, do, but if you're doing power rankings, aren't power rankings all about what have you done for me lately? Mm, more or less, yeah. Yeah. So I just, you know, I just, I, I find that interesting, you know, with maybe that's the way the, the, the poll feels too, like the, you know, looking at that. But at the same time too, I also feel like it's, like you said, what have you done for me lately? It's, it's difficult to what? judge this team because Virginia Tech, it's almost like they've had two, seasons per se would you wouldn't you say it's kind of fair to well, to break this down I, into two I, segments I, I would say that's fair um he had pit at third right Is that correct what you said um and he actually, you know what he said, his reasoning, he was joking about this. He said that Pitt took North Carolina to one overtime. We took North Carolina to <laughs> six overtime. Well, so that right. was his reasoning. Well, they also lost, uh, almost lost to Delaware. I mean, they beat Delaware 17-14. to 14. Correct. But if you, if you they, look. They, they were a field goal away from an embarrassing loss. Haven't they won seven out of their last eight or something they like have. that? You they know? have. I mean, so, yeah, I mean, it's fair because if, you, if you're doing power rankings, like, like I said, it, it's some what have you done for me lately and some overall record. Right, man. Right? Um, so it's fair t- to have Pitt it, over Virginia Tech um, because, yeah, they have won seven out of eight or something like that. I, I think, 
you know, the thing is that they're playing better right now than Virginia, but it's also fair to rank Virginia ahead of them because they have the same no, record who's, who's in, Virgi- in Virgi- Pitt. 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 And it's and Virginia beat them head to head. So it's fair to rank Virginia ahead of them. So you can you can make an argument for all three of those. Virginia Tech hasn't played either one of them yet. And by the way, um, Packer's great as he says on the show. He, his wife is a hokey, okay? Right. He's not he, he you know, anyways, good good talk here. I thought it would be fun to kind of open up and talk about some rankings. So real and, quick, you brought up brought up West Durham. I think I think I think Wes is outstanding. Um he did one of Tech's games earlier this year on the ACC network and I want to say it was Furman. He's he's a guy who does his homework. I mean, I was impressed with with him as he did play by play, I believe, not color. Mm-hmm. Play by no, play. no, he's play by play guy. Yep. Yeah, he did an excellent job. So I'm a, I'm a West Durham fan. Yeah, he's know. he's done play by play for a, Everybody a, likes play. to jump on these guys, you know, cuz it's something they put on Twitter, whatever. Well, any uh, okay, I didn't realize he did the Furman game. So I could understand now like I said, guys who vote in polls like this, they don't get to see every team play right. every week. All they do is look at results and look at right. box scores. You can't watch every game. He watched the Furman game, though. He was, he was there. there. He witnessed that semi-disaster. What was the final score? 24-17. 24-17, the right. onside it kick. Was, it was the... right. It was not not good. And so when you see something like that in person, it does. It makes an impression. It makes yeah. an impression yeah. on you. Last thing I want to do before we jump into Pitt, we're going to spend a ton of time on Pitt here on the Tech Sideline Podcast presented by the Fisher Law Firm. I always like to kind of start off with hokey news. Not not a ton that's come out of the press conference or Tech Talk Live this week, but um, a little bit more of, a, of, of scheduling news. We talked a little bit about it before we went on the air today, and that is that uh, the Hokies have added a home and home series with Vanderbilt. They'll go to Vandy in 2024, host Vandy in 2025. Um, looking at a tweet from Andy Bitter, who kind of laid out the entire uh, 2020 to 2030. And you look at some of the opponents that Tech has upcoming, of course, Penn State next year. Then they've got West Virginia, Notre Dame in 21, West Virginia 22. Purdue and Rutgers, 23. Vandy, Rutgers, 24. Vandy at Penn State, 25. Then they've got Maryland, BYU, Mar- uh, Arizona, BYU in the mix. So what and do you think that, about uh, that Maryland series is a four-game series. It right? is, yeah. 2027 through 2029. So the Hokies will be at home. I'm sorry, you're right, 26. I'm at Maryland in 26, home against the Terps in 27, at Maryland in 28, and then home against Maryland in 29. Yep. So, uh, so I know Vanderbilt's the big news. We've already talked about the, the Alabama in 2034. But what, <laughs> yeah, right, what, yeah. what do you guys make of the next decade for Virginia well, Tech football, the non-conference, the job that Whit Babcock's done? Two, trip to, two trips to Nashville in the next five years. Yeah, uh, uh, Virginia State. Tech plays at Middle Tennessee State next year, Murfreesboro, Murfreesboro, which is hard to say, and about 30, 40 miles outside of Nashville. So definitely doing that. You know, scheduling doesn't doesn't bother me like it bothers some people. Um, everybody complained about the home schedule this year, and I've gotten two of the most enjoyable games game experiences I've ever gotten in Blacksburg. Yeah, yeah you know, uh, so you and seeing Wake Forest, they yeah. were great. And Pitt's going to be cold, maybe a little rainy on Saturday, <laughs> but I expect it to be a good time. Yeah. Um, the football might not be all that pretty at times, and we'll get into that oh, later. Yes. But I expect it to be a good time. Um, so the scheduling doesn't th- doesn't bother me. This is the only sport, college sports. I, I mean, football and basketball. It's the only sport in the world, as far as I know, where the schedule isn't at least somewhat determined by computers, right? I mean, it's all human beings, right? Right. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so to me, it's just like there's so much. There's so many factors involved. You got 130 teams. You've got Oh, you know, your South Carolinas of the world who aren't going to play a road game against a Power 5 team in the same year where they have a road game at Clemson. You've got Wisconsin who Hooch. never actually wants to play you yeah, but we'll doesn't want to cancel the series. Andy Bitter said he was in college when that when that series was first announced. Uh, just, right? Come on, man. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's really, really hard to schedule. It's It's hard to find people who, if they want to play you, Everything matches up. They have an opening that year, and they can play a road game that year. Yeah. It's uh, I mean, I, I did an exercise, uh, I guess it was this past summer, where yeah. I looked at future schedules, ACC and Big Ten. I just I came up with only like two or three possible. You, you went opponents. through all the you went you went, went through, through Big Ten and SEC and a, a Big Ten and SEC. Sorry, yeah. And, and Chris did not go through Big Twelve and Pac twelve because that's just unlikely. Yeah, it's just unlikely. Those yeah. teams are so far away. Um, and it, it it was hard to find a match without a mm-hmm. bunch of teams just completely, you know, redoing their schedules. Yeah. Uh, By the way, off of uh, Andy's Twitter, so the Vanderbilt series takes place of Wisconsin, which was bumped 
back again to 20, 31, 32. So the Badgers yeah, can yeah, play yeah. Alabama. Um, but again, I mean, it's really intriguing. And I know we have a part of techsideline.com too, where you can see future schedules too. Um, yeah. And you're killing yeah. me because I actually tweeted out a picture of the power five and BYU matchups. Oh, um, which, go which that. Was really nice on, on tech sidelines so, the day that all that came out. So you left out that the Vanderbilt game in 2024, no, yeah, at at Vanderbilt in 2024. It's actually going to be in the Titans Stadium. Uh, I did not uh, see that part. What's the name of that stadium? Nissan. Well, it's currently Nissan Stadium. Who, Who knows, knows what it'll be, be in 2024? Yeah. And so that that's an important part of it because, uh, you know, I didn't get a chance to look at uh, Vanderbilt's attendance. Oh, I expect their, uh, sta- their stadium's pretty small, I'm sure. Yeah, it's, it's only like 50,000 maybe. Yeah, te- you know? tech fans will take a lot of people to that game. I, I think that's just a really good idea to put it in the Titans stadium. Uh, they It's probably a 60, 65,000 seat stadium sure. like most NFL stadiums. Yeah, Tech fans will show up it, in force. I don't know anything about Nashville. I've never been. Uh, maybe it's in a more fun part of town. I really don't know. Yeah, I don't I have know no about the stadium location. But, that's yeah. right. Well, look at this perfect graphic we have on tech sideline right now that is what everyone should go look at tech tech, sideline sideline twitter that is a great looking graphic there that's got the logos and everything so yeah so what i did was i cut out all of the i'll cut out all of the acc contests i cut out the teams the games against fcs Mm -hmm. teams uh odu and i just put in the matchups against power five teams byu and notre dame so you get a look at the stuff that tends to be more interesting Last thing we'll talk about with the schedule. I, I do think it's interesting uh, seeing Maryland back on the schedule. I'm, I'm sure for some ACC diehards, I remember you know Maryland, of course, in the ACC, some great games between Tech and, and, and Maryland throughout the years. That'll be certainly unique to have that back on the schedule. You know, I've been to College Park once. Yeah, I went for the 2005 game. I went for the 2005 game. And what struck me was uh, that, that there's this little barn and farm Right in the middle of campus, an urban campus. And really? there's, yeah, it's and I had a couple friends who went to vet school at Tech who went to undergrad at Maryland, and yeah, they they were in that department. They they always thought it was hilarious too that you're in the middle of campus, in the middle of Maryland. You walk around the corner and oh, there's a barn and some horses, and then there's a farm scene, and then everything around it is wow. just so very Maryland. Yeah, so that's the only thing I remember. I didn't have a good time, to be honest. So with uh, you. Uh, Evan, you were probably like ten or something in 2005. How old were you? I would have been. Five or six. <laughs> yeah, that was a uh, that was a real that was a that was an intense game. Vic when, threw when three Tech picks. Went, yeah, um, and and Maryland had a linebacker. Was it Dequell Jackson? Who maybe really uh, Tech had beaten Maryland fifty five to six in two thousand four, uh-huh. and Maryland was foaming at the mouth that night, and it was just really the place was full. Was that at College Park? Was it that was at game? College Park? That was when they had pretty decent players. Yeah, the only yeah. Maryland game that I can really remember well, good uh, good memory was Darren Evans broke the the, the rushing record against yeah. Maryland. Correct, two thousand eight, oh. he did. So I ran over that safety in the process. Yeah. At, uh, yeah. Skinner, uh, Terrell Skinner, Terrell Skinner. Yes, yeah. so so. So go go over to YouTube and search for uh, Darren Evans, Terrell Skinner. The video quality is really bad on that on the highlight on <laughs> but YouTube. But what you but want to listen fun. to is yeah. the announcers. It, that it was, was back Herb's when it was, Herb Street. It was yeah. Fowler and Herb Street, and, and they just kind of lose it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, speaking of like good good hits, this kind of transitions well. One of the first memories I have a Tech Pit game. I don't know what safety it was for Tech. It might have been like thirteen or fourteen, but a Pit player caught the ball at about the ten yard line. Someone came over and oh, just that crushed was. a pit receiver. Oh, that was Kashawn Jarrett. Kyshawn 30, 34, Jarrett. right? Yeah. He's wearing number. I can remember it was number 34. I couldn't remember his. And that it probably would be targeting or something today. today. <laughs> <laughs> but that's one of the biggest hits I've ever seen in person. That is a great way to transition into what is going to be a big game, to say the least, this weekend in Lane Stadium. 7-3 and three Pittsburgh, 7-3 and three Virginia Tech. Both teams with a chance to win the Coastal. Hokies trying to uh, avenge a game last year where Pitt got accomplished just about everything they wanted and more against the Hokies at Heinz Field. And that is something that has been talked about this week. Bud Foster said at his press conference yesterday that you know he's you know they remind the guys, they look at the tape, so uh, I put this behind the paywall. This was in my Monday column last year. Um, Pittsburgh averaged averaged on 47 plays. They averaged 13.91 yards per play. They had 654 yards of offense on 47 plays. 13.91. And somebody asked Bill Connolly, and this will be in our preview today. Somebody asked Bill Connolly, you know, is that the biggest margin you've ever seen? 
And Connolly, who's a big stats guy, threw it into his uh, into his database search. And let me let me try to verbalize this correctly. In in games between two FBS teams dating back to 2005, that was the largest average per play in games between two FBS teams dating back to 2005. I went through this very complicated exercise in my Monday Thoughts last year of calculating how many games we're talking about. And it's actually not the number of games, it's the number of offensive performances against an FBS team. So, so that is actually twice the number of games. I'll cut it down for you. It came out to 18,000 offensive performances against FBS defenses, and that was the biggest yards. Per, it was 13.9. The next closest was 13.5. It wasn't like it squeaked out. That is, I want to repeat myself, in, in 14 years of football and 18,000 offensive performances, Pitt averaged more yards per play than any team had done, like, ever. That's how bad that beatdown was last year. And I went back and I read my Monday thoughts. I actually picked Virginia Tech to win that game (laughs) 27-24. And they got curb stomped. Remember that they were playing better, right? The week before they'd played pretty well against BC, I think. Yeah. uh, And and Pitt was similar to BC and and how they run their offense. And and, and, and my, my big Monday thoughts was, I'm out. I'm done. This, this really, I said this was like a pitcher of cold water to the face. I know now what we're looking at. And, yeah, it kind of kept going that way for, for a while, you know. So, and then came UVA. Yeah, and, and Marshall and UVA, and they, they got it turned around. But that, that kind of puts it into perspective for you. So, again, Pittsburgh and Tech have had some great games over the last couple of years, excluding last year. I mean, you go back to uh, 2016, Joey Sly had a bunch of field goals up at Heinz Field. Uh, Tech went in and really, it was actually a really solid game that the Hokies played and beat Pat Narduzzi and the Panthers. Then, of course, the infamous goal line stand in 2017 at Lane Stadium. Reggie, Reggie Floyd making the tackle, mm-hmm. the, the game-saving tackle. Um, After Mook got just run over. That was the, <laughs> I guess, the last game of Mook Reynolds' career at Virginia Tech. Was it really? I don't think so. He didn't play the rest of the year. Wow. Did not know? Yeah, that. because he was he was hurting, it and that tight end ran him over, and that was a concussion it. or something. Yeah. yeah. And then last year, of course, as Will just said. So that's where we are in the series right now. As I always do when we get ready for a, a preview, and we talked about it a little bit on Monday, that this team is – really good defensively uh-huh. this Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh yeah. pan- so let me ask this in terms of defenses that tech has gone up against this year where does this Pittsburgh team rank they're the best they're the most physical up front and they're the two best corners um they're, they're very very good Pitt is so unique in that they aren't just bad in two of the three phases they are awful in two of the three phases of the game offense and special teams they are terrible yeah but their defense is so good that they're still seven and three um, so the shades of late two thousands Virginia Tech. Except, yeah, except know, Tech it, was generally not like they were good. Not, in special. Yeah, teams. right. Yeah, they were good in two of the three phases. Um, but yeah, Pitt, their defense is just really ridiculously good. Um, their two corners, the, the the four corners you see in this game, it's going to be the best corner versus corner matchup of the season. Uh, Dane Jackson and Demore Mathis. They've been targeted 90 times this year, and only 35 of those have gone for completion. So, so the two pit guys and the two tech guys have been targeted a total of 90 times. No, the Is two pit guys. Uh, I, I, I put – no, just – just. Just the pit guys. I put the, their combined stats in my game preview, okay. which, right. the, which is what you're remembering. Um, uh, they've allowed just two of 21 deep targets to be caught against them. Two of 21. Right. You're not going to go deep on them. Right. Uh they're, they don't give up big plays. Uh, opposing quarterbacks complete fewer than 50% of their passes against them. Um, they lead the nation in sacks. It's a dominant, yes. Uh, they're they're dominant on third downs. I mean, this is a dominant elite defense. The best Virginia Tech has faced here this year, not even close. Yeah. Even Miami. Oh, yeah. Way better than Miami. Yeah, Miami's got talent, but they don't. But they don't necessarily play all that disciplined or yeah. all that well at times. But yeah. uh, this is a much, much better defense. And, and, and as Will, not to steal your segment here, but I'll tee you up on it. There's a lot of um, – there's a good amount of uh, redshirt seniors over on the defensive side of the ball, especially in the linebacking core. Yeah, I think they've got five seniors on defense. Is that right? No, they've got two. No, that's offense. 
one, two, three, four, five. You're right, five seniors. Yeah. Um, so it's incredible. So the 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 pit stat last year, and I keep repeating this, was they had something like twenty seniors and. And 19 of the 20 seniors were redshirt seniors, and Darren Hall was the only one who was a true senior last year. Um, and yet they still have five seniors starting on defense. And let's see, uh, four of – well, three of them are redshirt guys. Um, so when I went through uh, the leading guys from their roster, I always take the full uh, – on our roster cards, we can only fit 86 guys. And everybody's roster has like 115 people listed. Which is kind of weird because you're only supposed to have 105 guys on your roster. 85 scholarship, 20 walk on. Is that correct? Uh, I think after the season starts, you can expand. I think you only got to have a, can only have 105 in the preseason. Okay. So you always see guys added right after the season starts. So, so most rosters that I, the raw roster that I download is like 115 guys. So I got to eliminate close to 30 of them to mm -hmm. uh, to to get it down to 86 guys that I want to put on our roster card. And with Pitt, it's easy. You just get rid of all the true freshmen. Um, now that said, they've got two true freshmen that play um, a lot, and then a third guy that's played in five games. But uh, that's how you build a program that wins seven, eight, nine, ten games a year. You know, ABR always be redshirt. Mm -hmm. I like that. <laughs> you know, we 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 mentioned this Pittsburgh team last year. Clearly, it seems like a little bit better offensively than last year. Um, different. I'm sorry, different. Yes, but. Um, just kind of lost my train of thought there. This Pittsburgh offense, as Will said, taking a little bit of a deeper dive and look at them, they throw the ball oh, a lot because with Kenny Pickett. Yeah, because they can't run it, which is shocking for Pitt that this is one of the worst offensive uh, rushing teams in the country. Yeah, so so the Pitt offense you're used to seeing run it's with not the power running offense. game, that's not what you're going to see. Yeah, um, I forget the exact stats. I put it in my game preview, which will be out later today, but – I think it was it was something like this. Last year against Power 5 competition, Pitt averaged something like 250 yards per game rushing and 5.79 yards per carry. Oof. This year against Power 5 competition, they're averaging like 112 rushing yards and 3.1 3 .1 yards per carry. Right. I so, mean, it's been quite a turnaround and in the wrong direction. I mean, they, they've gone from literally being one of the best to literally being maybe the worst. And, and don't they throw it something like 40 times a game? A little over 40 like, times a game like with Pickett. Third most in the country yeah, or something um, like that? Yeah, they do, and they never throw it deep. Um, if you sit here and look, average depth of target for Kenny Pickett is uh, 7.9 yards, which is the shortest in the ACC. Yeah. Uh, they want to keep the clock moving and everything like that, but they can't run the football. So that they actually use the passing game to try to keep the chains moving and, and things like that. That They just don't have – that they, they, they don't ha, haven't shown the ability to hit big plays through the air yeah. this year. So they're they're an extremely limited offense. One of the most limited offenses Tech has faced this year. Yeah, their leading rusher AJ Davis just 465 yards on the ground, four touchdowns. At this point in the season, typically you're seeing running backs around the 600, 700, 800 yard mark. Yeah, and I I don't I don't know how much of it is how much it is their running backs. I mean Davis has 30 fewer carries than McLeese. Um, I don't know how much of it is their running backs or their offensive line. I, I don't think their offensive line is good. I think they had a bunch of seniors on the offensive line last year and just couldn't replace them. And I think their top two running backs were also seniors last year. Probably yeah, their Darren, tight end Darren was Hall a senior. And some other guy. Right, right. Um, yeah, both of them had big games against Tech last year. That's <laughs> yeah. all I remember. They all uh, kind of run together. Yeah, the offensive <laughs> line, every single one that starts on the O-line for Pitt are, uh, is a redshirt. Redshirt sophomore, redshirt junior, redshirt sophomore, redshirt senior. Uh, that, 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 that hasn't helped them in, in this case. So uh, one of another interesting stat, and credit goes to uh, message board poster AIS Hokey 5 who mm -hmm. does an advanced stats breakdown on our uh, subscriber board. He pops in every week and just spits out about eight or ten paragraphs of, of interesting stuff. He, uh, like us, he he has a subscription to PFF, Pro Football Focus, and but he goes through the stats in a different way than we do, and he find he finds interesting things and. Yeah, for instance, Maurice French, they're, I, th I think Maurice is their leading receiver. With two Fs. Uh, second. It's like French. A, a Ron. Uh, let's Mac see. has 693 yards. He has 606. French is a leader in number of, uh, in terms of number receptions. of receptions. Correct. He has 75 receptions, but he only averages 8.1 yards per catch, and his average target depth is uh, 5.9 yards downfield. So um, Pickett is throwing to French, like, you know, just six yards downfield. And so that, that feeds into that, 
all that statistical analysis of they just don't stretch your defense. Uh, and so I was thinking about all this, and, and it reminded me of when Tech lost the 2005 game to Miami, 27-7. to I, I remember going back and watching film and breaking that game down. And, you know, it looks like Miami completely dominated Tech. Tech had – didn't uh, didn't Marcus Vick have – he had five turnovers, I think. Here's five counting. or six. He had yeah. a lot. And Miami won 27 to 7. And I remember analyzing it, and Miami kept picking up the first down by like one or two yards. If it was third and eight, they got nine yards. If it was third and three, they got five yards. They were just barely picking up first down after first down after first down. And I, I, that's what Pitt, when, they're, when their offense is functioning well, tends to do to you. And the other thing I want to tell you about Kenny Pickett is Kenny Pickett is not perceived as a runner. But they get him outside the pocket a lot in, in this this uh, um, deep dive into in um, stats breaks it down for you. Let's see. Um, he has 35 scramble runs, which is the third most in the ACC. 37% of his scrambles have gone for a first down or a touchdown. So they get him outside the pocket a lot, even though he's, he's not, quote, unquote, a running quarterback. I think Kenny Pickett drives you a little insane because he he doesn't look that fast, and yet you have trouble tackling him, and he keeps getting outside the pocket and picking up the first down. So it wouldn't surprise me to see him drive you a little nuts on Saturday. And I saw some of this in the uh, North Carolina pit game last Thursday night. Now, you know, granted, North Carolina doesn't have a good defense, but somebody came on our message board and said, I'm sorry, is Pickett that hard to tackle? He keeps breaking tackles and barely getting the first down, and it'll it'll drive you a little bananas. And didn't did Chris? Didn't we kind of get a preview of this two years ago? Yeah, he came in. He entered the game at halftime. I think Donardo was their start. I can't remember their starting quarterback's yeah, name. It was an it Italian was type name. Like oh. He got knocked out, and Pickett came in as like a true freshman. I think he was. He looked good, didn't he? Too. That, he, he, he looked look, good he for looked, a true freshman. He looked like trouble down the road. Is right, what he looked right. like. Yeah, that, that, that's what he looked yeah. like. I agree. Um, the thing about Pitt's offense is uh, people talk about how bad it is in the red zone. It's one of the worst red yeah, zone we'll offenses Yeah, we'll get to the, the stats on that in a well, second. It's one, of the, it's one of the worst, whether they're in the red zone or not. All right, they play, they operate like they're in the red zone all the time. All right, the, the thing that makes red zone offense difficult is you've only got 20 yards of space, let's say, or less. Let's say you have the ball on the, on the 10 yard line, and uh, and you're and you've only, it means you've only got 20, 20 yards Can't of room to work field. with. Like you can condense your coverage. So. It's like Pitt, they never go deep, so it's like they're operating in the red zone all the time. They don't stretch you vertically, so defenses can condense against them. You you can play your safeties up in the box and because you know they're very unlikely to throw it over your heads, and I think that that's one of the things that makes them easy to defend. Yeah. Yeah, we're talking about the uh, Pittsburgh Panthers coming into town this Saturday. Hokies and the Panthers both 7-3. and three. Uh, The coast on the line. Everything's on the line, as Will said earlier in the podcast. I mean, nothing. You look at this schedule, right? I mean, it's 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 funny how we we're talking about this offense. You've got the red zone stats, which we'll share in just a minute. But this is a team right now that, yeah, they lost thirty to fourteen to open up the season against UVA. They lost seventeen ten in a game against Penn State that they really could have I think, won. I, I, they could at least sent that to overtime. They should have sent it to overtime. They 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 were the ones who stopped this whole Central Florida undefeated yeah. regular season for a thirty in a row. They I haven't went, heard a thing about Central Florida since Pitt beat them. <laughs> they won 35-34. They put on that grant. I know UCS defense, smaller conference, probably not, but still put up thirty five points. But then the next week they respond with this a seventeen fourteen win against Delaware. Uh, field goal 33-30 over Duke. 27-20 over Syracuse. They lost to Miami. They beat Georgia Tech, and they beat North Carolina 34-27. My question is this. Um, there might not be a, a straight answer to this, but it does feel like this team, it, it statistically, is, as mediocre as we're talking about this offense, it feels like they've found ways to score. Like They've put up 30 points multiple times this year. So is that a result of, you think, just defense not being as strong? Do you think that'll change Probably. because Tech's a stronger defense this week? Well, yeah, before he before Chris answers that, um, you know, Pickett's been named ACC quarterback of the week twice. He had over 400 yards of, of total offense against North Carolina last uh, Thursday. Yeah, I mean, I guess they've had their moments, but they also scored 17 against Delaware, 20 right. against Ohio, uh, 20 against Georgia Tech. 
But remember, man, the, right, that, just, that, they haven't beaten anybody by more than ten points this year. All right, their offense isn't good enough to blow anybody out. But I haven't watched every single one of their games. Uh, I, I did watch part of the UVA game when they got trounced. I watched the first half of their game against Miami when I was at the gym, basically, and they got trounced. Every time I've watched them play, they've got trounced. Or the Miami didn't trounce them, but. It was 16 to 14, but Pitt's offense got trounced. Let me tell you what, though. You don't go back this far, Evan, but I remember in 1999, Tech took their, you know, national championship caliber team up to Pittsburgh. And and they, they beat Pittsburgh, but Pittsburgh threw for something like 400 yards that night in the middle of getting sacked 10 times. Uh, that was the 99 season. 2000 season, Tech barely beat them on a last second field goal. They stomped Tech in 01, 02, 03. The Pittsburgh team, historically, the Pittsburgh team you see for the rest of the season is not the one that plays Virginia Tech. The one that plays Virginia Tech is a level above the one that plays the rest of the season. If I sound irritated, it's because I am. They drive me bananas. This is 20 years now (laughs) that they've played above their heads. They used to have a quarterback. I think the guy's name was John Terman. John Terman looked like an NFL quarterback playing against Tech, and then he'd, you know, wet the bed against everybody else. It's... Do not be surprised if if Pitt's just doing non pit things on Saturday. It's it's what they do against Virginia Tech. Kenny Pickett, twenty five of forty one, three hundred and fifty nine yards and a touchdown against North Carolina. I mean, you're right. It it does Breaking feel like tackles running for first downs. <laughs> it was seriously. I mean, uh, this has nothing to do with stats, but I always feel like there are a couple of teams. You always talk to Tech fans you're like, oh, not them again. You know, it's just always. East Carolina, for the longest time, I feel like always had Tech fans just like, oh, my God, it's ECU. You never know what's going to happen. ECU yeah. always plays up to the level of Tech's competition. Until they stopped. Until, until they didn't. Until th- time and events caught up with them. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Pittsburgh. I mean, Pittsburgh, I feel like every year when the schedule comes out and Pittsburgh's all right, it's at Pittsburgh. Every Hokey fan will look and all. It's like, oh, that game's scary. And it doesn't matter who's on Pitt. And, and, it's and, always just a game to, to back up your statement that everyone's always kind of holding their breath about. And I'll bet Miami feels that way about Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech has been extremely point. competitive with Miami over the years. Um, you know, even even Tech's worst teams. Uh, I think Miami should feel that way about everybody at this point. Well, They lost to Georgia Tech, for goodness sake. Yeah, let's not turn this into Miami <laughs> yeah. discussion. Though. A couple podcasts ago, we nearly went down a road. We could have talked mm-hmm. about Miami for mm-hmm. an hour. Uh, quickly, before we, we step us up, we've talked about the defense, the offense. Read us the red zone offense numbers do of Pitt. Have, because do we have those on here? I do. I, I, this I, is I, really I fascinating compared uh-huh. to what the red zone defense is. And this will be my um, – the this is in my portion of the game preview where we do our predictions. So uh, I'll just read it to you. In 45 trips to the red zone, Virginia Tech has scored 43 times. That's 95.6%, number five in the nation, um, including 31 touchdowns, which is 69%. Okay. 95.6% overall, 69% touchdown rate. Pittsburgh has made 33 red zone trips and has scored 26 times, which is 78.8%, number 94 in the country. So Virginia Tech has a number five red zone offense in the country, and Pitt has a number 94 red zone offense in the country. And Pitt's touchdown rate is just 48.5% in the red zone, where Tech's is 69%. So... This is going to come down to uh, – it may come down to just who can score in the red zone, who can get to the red zone and then score. Mm-hmm. Um, defensively, they're very comparable. Tech's 14th in the country, Pitt is 25th. So that's not really a separator, but the separator is the offenses. Uh, you know, if if uh, if you're a Virginia Tech fan and you haven't read this or, or – studied this it might surprise you to know the number five red zone offense in the country now i can't sort i couldn't didn't have time to sort the uh ncaa stats on touchdown percentage but i'm betting the 69 percent for virginia tech is pretty good i absolutely love when people on twitter just throw an emotional thought out there with absolutely no facts to back it up tech can't score when they get in the red zone somebody dropped that on me a few weeks ago and i went back i said literally virginia tech went is this and this rank this and touchdowns and this and everything else and blah 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 and then like just like that he deleted his tweet right you know yeah. Uh, yeah, so. I, I, I love when people get emotional on Twitter and then I can call them out with facts it's great to be fair most people don't have the time to do their research you're like correct do, look at him don't. smiling right there <laughs> it's actually one of my small pleasures in life right. but yeah like like yesterday when when I put on there I said uh, 
the fact that Virginia Tech Virginia is a noon game on on ABC on Black Friday is a sign of respect. Uh, and I said those noon games outdraw the three thirty like ESPN games things like that. And people are like, yeah, but this is Friday, not Saturday. And then I actually put the numbers up there about how like Miami Pitt on Black Friday at noon on ABC drew like two million more viewers than a Georgia game at Saturday at noon on wow. ABC. Wow. Um, yeah, so there's Friday noon games uh, on ABC. They actually didn't have one last year, I don't think. Or if they did, it wasn't – they didn't right. have they didn't have the numbers for it. But, yeah, uh, uh, that's going to be so, – so people were saying, yeah, but that's not true. You know that's not true. And I'm like, actually, no, here <laughs> here's, here's, the, here's the actual numbers. Yeah. So, by the way, we, we just wrapped up the pit conversation. I was about to take a break, but I'm sure we will we will have to talk about this uh, in the question portion so we can go ahead and knock it out now that Tech and UVA is going to be a noon, noon kick or 1230? Noon. Noon. Noon on ABC, UVA, and Tech. Don't want to spend too much time talking about it, but oh, how, how do you how do you feel about it? Well, the, that's, the, that's the, the best you asked a football player. Like, Dwight Vick brought this up on Twitter, and he brings up an excellent point. When you're on the road, man, and you're a player, you want to play at noon. You're not sitting around the hotel that you're not used to all day. You just go in there and get it over with. Get back to Blacksburg. You can take the Commonwealth Cup to Tots. Plenty of time to do all that. <laughs> uh, go in there and, and take them out early, and then go home and celebrate. I mean, that, that's what you want if you're if you're on the road, if you're a player. Uh, no, I realize it doesn't help your tailgating plans any. Right, uh, it, that it, sucks. But you know, just wake up earlier. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Hit, hit, hit up your buddies in Charlottesville and sleep on their floor the night before the game and get there early if you're a traveling fan. There you go. I think that's well said. All right, let's do this. Let's step aside for a timeout on the Tech Sideline podcast. When we come back, predictions, 7-3 and three Pittsburgh, 7-3 and three Virginia Tech. It's all on the line. We'll break it down here on the Tech Sideline podcast and get to your Facebook Live questions. This is the Tech Sideline podcast, proudly presented by the Fisher Law Firm. Welcome back aboard Tech Sideline Podcast presented by the Fisher Law Firm. We've got Malcolm Stewart behind the scenes producing on the podcast set. Chris Coleman, Will Stewart, I'm Evan Hughes. We're having a great podcast so far, breaking down Virginia Tech and Pitt. We've talked a lot about the Panthers. Uh, If you missed Monday's podcast, be sure if you're uh, on YouTube or if you're listening on SoundCloud, it's just below. Uh, You can listen to the recap over Georgia Tech. But now it's time to combine that and what we just talked about, Pitt, and come up with predictions. Uh, one of the best parts of our Wednesday podcasts, we've talked about how good this Pittsburgh defense is, how this Pittsburgh offense struggles. Obviously, again, uh, everyone knows it, but it's worth mentioning again, Tech, uh, there is a scenario if they lose that they can win the Coastal, but they don't control their own destiny mm. if that happens. So a win would go along. Am I correct on that? Pittsburgh would have to lose to Boston College. Um, yes. that that's the scenario. Yeah. And so be, and then there'd be like a three-way tie. Right. There is some. I did hear if there's a right. four-way four, tie. Four that Tech tie. wins the tiebreaker. Right. Um. But essentially, a but, win would but go. If, but if Tech loses Saturday, they're not going to win a head-to-head tiebreaker against UVA. Is that correct? Well, no, they no, they no, won't no. win against Pitt. They, right. Yeah, yeah. If they beat UVA yeah. but lose to Pittsburgh, it would come right. down to like a four-way tiebreaker. I was listening. Packer and Durham was talking about. Then it would come down to Tech UNC somehow. Forget right. the first criteria, but then it's head-to-head. And since Tech beat UNC, um, well, Tech, or it was my, Tech it was beat so everybody in the Coastal Division, right? right? Uh, or it came down except, to except record. Duke, Duke doesn't matter. Right, record matter. in the Coastal against common opponents, right? And it's like uh, someone's two and one. I, I thought it was North Carolina. I could be wrong. And then it came down to who's head to head between those two, and Tech wow. has a tiebreaker. No okay. So, anyways, hmm. there's still a path to Charlotte, but a win obviously control their own destiny. That's the easier path. So. Without further ado, well, Stuart, I'll start with you. Give us a give us a score prediction. Someone who stands out. Of why you're going with that prediction? This game is going to be uglier than two naked fat guys hitting each other with two by fours. <laughs> <laughs> Good possibility. <laughs> Words I was not expecting that, to hear on the that's podcast. My prediction. Today, okay, <laughs> I'm trying to remember. We've already done our game preview. We just haven't posted it yet. I'm trying to remember what score I picked. Uh, I believe I picked. Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech's going to win. I think I picked twenty-four to thirteen. That's what I picked. Uh, that's what wow. you picked. Wow! What the heck? Did well, I did, pick? Uh, you generally you 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 don't read mine. You do yours, and then. But I accidentally read yours. Uh. Now I may have, <laughs> I may have gone lower than that. I may have gone twenty to thirteen. I said bet the under. I think the over under is forty-six. Last time I checked. Uh, now you watch it. They'll go out and have one of those thirty-nine, thirty-six games like they had back in twenty sixteen. <laughs> 
Uh, so that's, uh, um, I mean, I think we've broken it down for you pretty well. And, and yes, turnovers and special teams always matter, but they really matter in a game like this where as long as you don't – yeah, so let's – this is some nuance I wanted to get into, and Chris actually gets into it in his portion of the game preview. You know, if, if you're a Virginia Tech, um, uh, be patient because Pitt is not an explosive offense. Um, don't 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 do anything crazy, you know, just uh, on, on third and – Run draws on, on third, third and nine. nine, run the draw because yeah. Pittsburgh has a very, very high sack rate on third and long. In, in general, but on third – like third and long especially. Different schemes I heard they do uh, on third down defensively. So, yeah. so instead of taking the seven-yard loss on a sack, just run a three-yard draw and punt. You it's just ten yards, man. And, and Virginia Tech's net punting is seven yards better than Pittsburgh's net punting. Just – I don't like to use the word conservative. It's a dirty word in football. Uh, but call the call the game conservatively. Bide your time. Press your special teams' advantage, and be patient. And you will you will eventually get a break. Now the flip side of that is don't screw up. Do not give Pitt the ball close to your goal line. You know don't make big mistakes. And and I think I think I picked uh, something like twenty to thirteen tech. Yes. Yeah, so. When you're when you're booing Brad Cornelson for running a, a halfback draw on third and nine, re- remember that he and Fuente they're trying to win the football game more so than pick up a first down on that particular yeah. play. Yep. And and sometimes conceding the short game helps you in the long term because those extra yards add up. Um, Pitt gets so many sacks on third downs by teams that just bullheadedly try to pick up those nine yards against the two of the best cornerbacks in the country, right? Yeah. Um, it, it, it's really a bullheaded mentality. If you run that draw and pick up three yards, you save yourself a seven-yard sack maybe. That's ten yards of field position. And then it, every time each, each team exchanges a punt, that's seven yards in Tech's favor. So you're talking about 17 yards. Yeah. And that adds up in field position. That adds up maybe a field goal that you wouldn't have otherwise gotten. Uh Maybe you're in the red zone uh, when, when you wouldn't have been. Um, so this this is going to be a, a game for for people who have patience and and understand understanding how f- football coaches think or thinking a quarter or two ahead a lot of times. And I think Justin Fuente generally plays that game very very well. Yeah. And he does. I think he does a really good job of of not only and I said this against Wake Forest not only designing the game plan and, and figuring out. This is this is what we need to do to beat, beat Wake Forest. He does a great job communicating that to his team. This is what we have to do to win this particular football game, and they have an understanding of why he's asking them to do what he's asking them to do in the game plan when they get right. on the field. And and I, that's why I think Tech will be ready on Saturday. I think he'll do a good job of communicating to them what it's going to take to beat Pitt. Uh, I, I think Pitt's defense is absolutely elite. I mean, this is, a, in my opinion, a college football playoff level defense it's a highly rated defense that is combined with a bad offense and Any, bad special you got teams a, yeah anytime you got a highly rated defense and your offense and special teams are bad the defense is actually probably a little little underrated Correct. they're probably right. better than their stats right yeah that, that's probably accurate so you guys both have tech 24 13 maybe that, that 20 range, 13 yeah right. something, something like that uh oscar bradburn's your guy in this mm-hmm. game it's I, I think in looking at the last couple of games um you know, Oscar's currently tied for number one in the country at 48.3 yards per punt. Um, and, I, and I said that Tech's net punting is, is seven yards better than Pitt's. I think the last two weeks, Tech hasn't really had an advantage in punting. I think Wake Forest's punter was really good. I believe that uh, Georgia Tech's punter was really good. This is a situation where if you're trading punts, you have an advantage. I thought Georgia Tech's punter was good. I don't know if their coverage team was bad. Right, right. Um, you know, that the dangerous yeah, thing about having a really good punter is if you don't have a good coverage team, right. then – it could actually turn out to be bad for you. Tech has both. It seems and, and like Brad's burned, Brad Burns been so good at putting that ball not just inside mm-hmm. the twenty, but inside the ten. Right. So let's say you've got the ball on your your forty five, and you're facing third and nine. Um, yeah, run it three yards and have him pin him inside the ten. Don't get sacked and wind up with a pit guy catching a punt on the twenty. And you know, Do, I, th- I think who knows I th- what can happen then. We're yeah. belaboring the point here. Sure. You know, just patience on Saturday. 
Well, again, if uh, Will and Chris's predictions come true, then that means we are on a collision course for Charlottesville on Black Friday with all the marbles on the line. So um, great, great preview here to Pitt. And I'm sure we have a lot of questions on uh, Facebook Live. Malcolm Stewart, the best producer in the land. I'll throw it over to him. What's going on today, Malcolm? Give him a second while yeah. he gets his mic in position. <laughs> Got to turn it back on. <clears throat> all right. Let's start with. Cody Stepp. It's kind of a long one. Interested to hear your thoughts about the Friday game slots, not just the UVA Friday game, but ACC in general. I feel like in the past, Fridays would highlight the Conference USA and Mountain West. ACC had locks on Thursdays. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on the ACC taking over Friday games? I'm good with it. Um, I've run the numbers. Yeah, Chris, Chris is actually I've, 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 I've done the research and put this in an article a couple of years ago, actually. Uh, Thursday night games don't get as good a ratings as Friday night games anymore. You know, like like when Virginia Tech plays on Friday night against UVA, it gets a higher rating than their Thursday night game against Miami or Pitt or whoever um, because there's NFL competition on Thursday night. So this program was built partially on, on Thursday night football, but that's not uh, – that's not applicable anymore, in my opinion. I think the, the dynamics have changed in those Thursday night games. They're just they, – they, they don't get you the exposure that they used to. And yeah. More people actually watch the Friday night games, at least as far as Virginia Tech goes. And I, and I have a little – I wouldn't call it a rant, but I was thinking about this uh, earlier this week. You know, this, this time of the season, you can watch college football – basically Tuesday through Saturday. Mm -hmm. They put Mac games on and things Some action like Tuesday, yeah. Wednesday. Thursday is is just not the marquee matchup it used to be, but um so so don't don't view it that way. There are actually some good college games on Friday. It's almost like the new Thursday. Um but it, it's it's kind of sad to me because uh I remember years ago, years ago, three, four, five, six years ago, I used to like watching the the Maction on Tuesday, uh, on Wednesday and Thursday. Now it's just games played in front of empty stadiums. Yeah, um, yeah. it is, and there there are articles on this. the The action during the week is killing the conference. It's absolutely killing it. Because in a good way. No, a bad. A way. bad way. Okay. The TV money's fine, but nobody's coming to the games anymore. So you have entire generations of, of Mac fans growing up. They don't go to the games because they're all during the week. Well, I'll, I'll be honest too. I, I watched one of them or a highlight of something. And you're 100. percent I looked up in the stands. I was like, oh my goodness. It's it's not. You know, sometimes you watch games. You like to watch a UVA game, and you're like, man, look at that. The upper deck's almost empty. In Mac games, almost the entire stadium's empty anymore. Dude, this is not good. Dude, uh, this is not off topic. It kind of is, but. See, every game's on TV these days. Yeah. And there's only so many time slots, so somebody's got to play on Friday. I, I know. Right? Uh, do you remember the last time you were unable to watch a Virginia Tech game because it was not on television? I do not. Uh, 1999 JMU was the last Virginia Tech game I didn't watch on television. Grab your mic. Oh, there you go. 1999 Virginia Tech JMU. Michael Vick's debut. Really? I couldn't watch it on TV. I had to listen to it on the radio. Huh. Yeah. I'll, I can never remember a time where a game was not available uh, on a stream or either. I was, or, or you know, I mean, I started school two years later, so I was at all the home games. If there was a non televised yeah, game there, after that, I don't there remember. Were probably some bad, maybe, maybe a couple here and there. Yeah, but certainly in the last fifteen, seventeen years, every single game's been on television mm. somewhere. So uh, to get back to the question from a personal standpoint, I love playing on Friday. That means I got the whole weekend off to watch other college football games. Yeah. So uh, yeah. anyway, it's not an insult, and, really. It's, and I think it's better for the fans anyway. Um, and Friday games in general, you know, you don't have to take two days off work if you're coming from like Virginia Beach or Northern Virginia or something versus like that. Versus a Thursday game. Right. Versus a Thursday game, right. Uh, let's see the other thing too. The NFL has put a lot of time and, and money into Thursday night football and a lot of the matchups have been really good. I'll be honest with you. Unless it's a matchup that really matters to Tech, I'm watching the NFL every time. Right. Right. right, right. Like, like this this season's first game was like Packers-Bears, right? Right, which was unbelievable. You want Virginia Tech to be up against Packers-Bears? Yeah. There's no, no chance. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Good question. Hmm. Got right. us fired uh, up. Yeah, dude. <laughs> Tom Dunnington. Uh, a lot have been said, a lot has been said about the possible positive effects of Mr. Kill, and that's mm -hmm. all actually speculation. However, one thing that jumps out at me is the way the light has seemed to come on for the entire defense since his arrival. With that said, do you think the opponent scouting quality has gone up due to him possibly leading that effort in some sort? Will lead us off. The kill question. Yep. Uh, I've been told by my family next time somebody asks the kill question, just say, hey, he's killing it. He's killing it. <laughs> <laughs>
Do you have an opinion? I, I, I don't have an opinion. I mean, you know, we'll, we'll never find out the story of how much of a messiah Jerry Kill is or isn't, you know. Mm. For all I know, he's eating Doritos just hanging out in the locker room. <laughs> or he's just completely taking over the whole operation. Quick, quick thing. I, I, I've, I've, I've actually th- – I think I can answer. It. Okay, go ahead. All uh, right. I, I don't think you, he's. I don't, I don't want to answer. It I don't. I don't think he's done much for for Virginia Tech's defense. Uh, there might, might be some helping out with self scouting. Maybe he's done some of that. I, I don't know. But I, I think generally speaking, the improvements of the Tech defense is just a bunch of young players getting older and getting better throughout the course of the season. I think that's the main thing. And they have more talent than they had last year. Quite frankly, they I might actually give more of that credit to Fuente for making practices tougher. Tougher because you know, which the, could also be an influence. Influence a kill. Switch to the other side of the ball. I, I do think you know they said the very first week he was hired, and Brad Cornelson's even the offensive coordinator even said this. He said the first thing Jerry Kill is going to help us out with is the running the game. running game, and he said that in the press conference leading up to the Duke game, and the Duke game was the first game Jerry Kill was part of the program for, and that's the first time we saw Hendon Hooker in a football game, and that was the night Deshaun McLeese. The only thing that went well that night was Deshaun McLeese rushing for 100 yards in the running game and looking That's better. That's true. And I do think Jerry Kill has influence over with Hendon Hooker being Virginia Tech's starting quarterback. Uh, I think if you recall uh, Justin Fuente, and I think VT Golfer put this on our board recently, um, Justin Fuente's philosophy when he first got to Virginia Tech was throw to score and run to win. When he chose Ryan Willis as his starting quarterback, it was to try to take advantage of what everybody thought would be the strength of the team, wide receiver. But throwing gets you points. It doesn't get you wins with Fuente's philosophy. And then Hooker's a starting quarterback. That doesn't help Damon Hazleton any. Right. It's helped us win a lot of football games, though, hadn't it? Because we've been able to run the football, and running wins football games. So I think somebody, I think he came in and pointed out to Fuente that you've gotten away from your philosophy, your run-to-win philosophy, by going with Ryan Willis as your starting quarterback. I, I do think Jerry Kill has some responsibility with Hendon Hooker being Virginia Tech's starting quarterback, and that's not something that Fuente should be criticized for. I um, mean, college football is a business Every business out there, not every business, but a many lot businesses. of bu- many businesses out there. You know, Jerry, Jerry Kill is a consultant, for lack of a better term. He's 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 the Bob's in office space, right? Right. He's coming in and, and cleaning house, uh, for better or for worse. He's he's in some for depending on your point of view. He's the bad cop. He's certainly the bad cop for Ryan Willis, right? <laughs> <laughs> and the good cop for Endon Hooker, but he's the Bob's, and and what they shouldn't be criticized for. For using that, because well, you know, because first of all, coaches use consultants all the time. I mean, yeah, look at Nick yeah, Saban, I mean, Matt the, Brown's uh, yeah, sixty-seven years old. He's got two of them. He's got two Jerry kills on his staff, mm-hmm. um, and he's he's been around and seen everything. So I, I, it was such a really good decision to hire Jerry Kill. I think because sometimes you need someone who is not quite hands on. That they're close enough to where they know your personnel, they know how you like to coach. They know the players, but they don't directly coach any position. They're not close to anybody. They they can take not necessarily the 10,000-foot view because they are somewhat close, but a 5,000-foot view and say, okay, here's what you're not seeing because you're ground level. And I think that's what Jerry Kill has been able to do, and and I think he's made a big impact on Tech's offense because I do think the decision to start Hendon Hooker at quarterback, and I could be wrong on this, but I do think Kill has something to do with that because I think he pointed out that you need to get better running the football if you want to win football games and just asking your offensive line, your freshman offensive lineman to block better each and every week and expecting your senior quarterback who has made the wrong decisions his entire career in the read options and magically start making the right ones overnight, it's just not going to happen. you got to put in Hooker. So the, I think the question was specifically about Kill's effect on the well, defense. It was, and, and right, I, and, I, I just, and I totally flip-flopped it. I, I, I just I don't know that there is one there. I, I think it's probably the toughening up of practices. It's just general team mojo. Yeah. And again, the thing is, again, we're we're never going to know what exactly he has. I think you know, I think he's I, I think he's to. had a direct effect on the offense. But I but your team mojo, I do think that's had an indirect effect on the defense. On the, you'll yeah. Say. Yeah. yeah. Great question as always. Appreciate it, Malcolm. What else do we have? Uh, there's a couple. How do I phrase these? Uh, let's talk about Pitt's head coach 
Specific. There's a question. Does he get on your nerves? Uh, he does. Lose the game with the lack of Pat discipline. Narduzzi. He, you know, he's uh, one of those guys. He's a fiery guy. He's a fiery guy. Now, here's the thing. You can't get annoyed with him being fiery on the sideline yeah. and then say Justin Fuente is too stoic, right? Yeah. What do you want? What, what, what do you want? I personally yeah. love Narduzzi on the sideline. I know uh, the 2016 game. I know, he, he, he put he, the video out. He, but went, I, he went crazy in that game. Uh, what was it what the ACC pers- that basically said after that season you need to behave on the sideline or we're going to throw the flag on you and, and that was pretty much uh, direct. He, he had a flag right. thrown on him in the Tech game, correct? Well, uh, Fuente only- had a flag thrown on him that year against Notre Dame. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm I. I think he's a fiery guy. I think he's a good fit for Pitt because I think he understands what you need to do to win there. Man, he's a great fit for Pitt. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you said you've got family members who are Michigan State people. I mean, and, yeah. and D'Antonio is not doing so hot these days. And he's, you know, let's face it, a lot closer to the end of his coaching career than he is the beginning. Man. Yeah. And, and you're right. Narduzzi would be a good fit somewhere like that. I mean, that, so he I was think. under D'Antonio. And for the record, he fits the – I mean, not to go on a tangent about Michigan State, but MSU has been – the last 10 years, I mean, they were in the college football playoff three or four years yeah. ago with Narduzzi as defense coordinator. Everyone always talks about, you know, obviously not now, but the Urban Myers and the Jim Harbaugh's and, you know, D'Antonio, Michigan State won nine or 10 games consistently with they Connor did. Cook and Kirk Cousins back in there, and Narduzzi was there. So to me, he kind of embodies the philosophy of Michigan State, always kind of flying under the radar. But when they play some of the better teams in the conference, it's always like, oh, man, uh, D'Antonio's a great coach. It's, and It's, you know, it's, like tough to recruit to pit to recruit well uh um you know what is good recruiting right yeah I, his, I, his rankings aren't going to be his rankings there. are never going to be good at pit, sure but he's going to red shirt guys and just because guys are red shirting and they don't start till they're red shirt juniors they were under they were under recruited guys anyway uh they don't have any ego so they're not going to you know transfer out after the first or second year if they're not in the starting lineup yet right. so you can you can actually build you know, actually build my dream team at Pitt because you, you know you can recruit guys under the red under the radar and and they'll every single one of them be will find a red shirt very acceptable. Sounds good, coach. Yes, yeah, so, there it is. Yeah, There's exactly. the red shirt of the right. <laughs> <So> <laughs> drink. <laughs> uh, yep. All right. Uh, I know you wanted to talk about that picture, maybe. Yeah, mm, I can't see it. Go ahead and lean out there and look at that, Chris. Oh, it's Gallo after the Pitt game. Yeah, that is uh, Eric, right? Yeah. Nick's yeah. the current Gallo, Nick's and Eric is Gallo. so uh, up on the screen. There is the the picture of Eric Gallo after last year, after the 2017 Pitt game, all by himself in Lane Stadium, kneeling down on the uh, logo at the center of the field, and just thinking, pondering that he's just played his last home game. Um, and that photo was taken by one of our posters, who goes by Newt N E W T. And I just thought it was – I was looking through my pit photos this morning from two years ago to pick one out for going up on the television, and and that one uh, that one was in my collection. And I'd, I hadn't forgotten about that. I'd just forgotten when it was. So that's, very cool that's picture. That's a powerful picture. Yeah, yep. It kind of um, reminds me of after the 2016 UVA game, uh, my boy Sam Rogers uh, proposed to uh, his uh, girlfriend. Yeah, I believe at the – I don't know if it was an end zone or at the 50-yard line, but I'm pretty sure that was uh, – that there was, was nice. a follow-up picture where I believe it was Bud Foster came out and got him and, and walked off with him, I think. You know, yeah, so for Gallo there. That, That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, very cool. That's picture. really cool. I, I want to I ask one question to kind of uh, – unless, Malcolm, do you have any more? Is there you that go. a good place to – I want to ask one question that I thought about. Um, uh, again, this was uh, brought up again on Packer and Durham. I thought it would be good to bring up to you guys because I think that there's a legitimate case for it. Could you make an argument – that Justin Fuente should be the ACC Coach of the Year this year. Uh, if he wins his last two games, absolutely. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. I, right. I, well, I he just, went, well, he won ACC Coach of the Year in 2016 by going nine and three and winning the Coastal with a six and two record. This would by, be identical. Yeah, after and, and after a tougher start, and more importantly, the turnaround. And it's That's funny what, this yeah. this came up on our boards, and somebody's like, "Oh, Dabo should get that." Uh, no. No, I don't think Dabo should get ACC D- Dab- Coach of the Dab- Year. Dabo should get a Lifetime Achievement Award. Right. But, uh, uh, and and I, I will say that it's unfair to coaches who are predicted to go undefeated that they can't exceed expectations. Yeah, right. It, you that, know? that's kind of you know where you wind up. Because yeah. um, uh, it used to happen to Beamer. All, it's not like Beamer won ACC Coach of the Year every year. They just gosh. won the Coastal every year, and that's what people expected. <laughs> so when you can't exceed expectations, it's hard right. for you to win awards like that. You know, Clearly, Dabo knows how to run a program. He's done a great job putting together his program. But if you want to talk about in-season coaching, 
if Virginia Tech beats Pitt, beats UVA, and wins the Coastal, the the in season coaching job is clearly the best in the ACC. I can't think of one that's even close. Um, Clawson probably would have gotten it until he ran well, into the, a couple yeah, of I think until, the, until the injuries weeks. caught up. I think the, 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 the one that you look out for is Scott Satterfield at Louisville. From 2-10 and 10 last year to bowl eligible, I think They've he's going to be he's in the running. A, yeah, yeah, he was really good at Appalachian State. But, you know, the, the, the point is just getting at is we've talked about it, but, again, I mean – I think that even the talk about it on like Packer and Durham ACC Network, I mean, Justin Fuente deserves a lot of credit for the no, turnaround no. that has happened this season. Satterfield is who UNC should have hired. And this is why UNC does not concern me long term. Uh, they made the style higher and they didn't make the substance higher. Well, they're, they're recruiting well. They're though. recruiting well, but recruiting well. But a lot of teams you see recruit well, like – like Larry recruited. Fedora recruited well the first few, the few years, right? Well, that'd get him, you know? It eventually got him a Coastal Championship, but they never really but had that, a good that, defense. Yeah, yeah. That right. onside never kick, never forget that against Clemson. Right, that, uh, yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, I just I, – I don't – I think a, a better hire for them, if they want to – if they're really interested in winning football games instead of just recruiting well and, and selling a few tickets, because they have sold out games this year, then they should have hired Satterfield. Yeah. Yeah. Real quick, I was going to look at actually uh, UNC football. Are, are they? Are they not bowl eligible yet? No, they're four and six. They're they got to they win their last two, and they play a F- Mercer and NC State. Mercer won't be an issue for them. NC State is decimated going, going by downhill. Injuries, yeah. They should beat NC State, so I, you sh- they should get into a bowl at six and six. I think. Okay, that that game will probably be a rock fight. That's two bad teams, but th- th- I don't. Know. I, I think. Well, I think UNC's lost so many close games. That's. Yeah. I know your record is what it says it is, but. You know, they've lost two overtime games. They lost, lost Clemson. to Clemson by one. Um, lost to Wake 24-18. Right. They're, 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 they lost to App State by three. By three. <laughs> lost uh, to Tech in six overtimes. Well, yeah, right. Um, so so they're close. NC State is just getting blown out each and every week right yeah. now. It's yeah. like they've quit. Well, listen, I thought that was a fun way to close the podcast. Thanks to everybody for the questions on uh, Facebook Live. Thanks, Malcolm, for uh, for getting those over. Uh, it was a great way to close out the podcast. And, again, it's a busy week. It's a busy time of the year. Thanksgiving's on the horizon, and that means that uh, Pittsburgh and, and Virginia Tech and then, of course, uh, UVA next week. It's an exciting time of the year. And I think, as you said on, it's on Monday, It's my favorite Will, time of year, man. When, when, when it's November and you're in the middle of it, you yeah. know, win or lose, it's, it's, your, it's my favorite time of year. And I think a good way to close it is something you said Monday. Enjoy this. You know, because you only, you know, week by week, you just don't know what's going to enjoy this moment. Be present where your feet are. Enjoy, um, you know, have, being able to have these discussions, being in the thick of it. Uh, it's a lot right better now. than last year was. That's for sure. hundred percent. All right, Chris, you know, what's coming. TechSideline.com. What's going on this week and what's going on next week? Oh gosh. I don't even want to think about next I week. I think our game preview that's going up later today is really good. Yeah. It, it doesn't mention a lot of names and personnel and things like that, but we talk about, what well, we talked about on the podcast, what it will probably take to win the game. Yeah, um, love it. And it gives you a lot of numbers and things like that. Um, we'll do a true freshman report tomorrow, Friday Q&A, or normal stuff. Next week, we have a football game on Friday and three basketball games Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. In Maui. In Maui. Um, I have no idea what the content plan is going to look like next week. Are you going to be here for a podcast, or are you going home for Thanksgiving? Oh, I have it's no complicated. idea. It's yeah, complicated. We, we, we have to talk about this yeah, afterwards, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah, we, so. we may actually do a Sunday podcast this week. Okay. Uh, if you're available, which we have not talked about yet. So oh, yeah, we will, uh, yeah. should be. Yeah. And, so. then, and then we might be able to do one on Wednesday. Is that right? On Wednesday. All right. So kind of – kind of. Keep an eye on the site if you're wondering when the podcast is going to be. It's, uh, it might be wind up being it might wind up being a Sunday Wednesday kind of deal. Cool. Well, yeah. I appreciate y'all's flexibility, and uh, yeah, looking forward to next week. It's going to be a busy week. Whatever happens this week, it's going to be a busy week next week. With uh, yeah. so uh, yeah, taking a look at men's basketball home. We're recording on Wednesday. They're going to play tonight against Delaware State, uh, and then of course men's hoops uh, in Maui football and uh women's basketball do want to shout them out they won last night they played on the actual acc network last night and uh knocked off maryland eastern shore they're off to a 4-0 start uh, so, i wish i got the acc did, network did kitley come back and come back into the game you know i i did not look at the box score i um I did not get a chance to watch i just saw the Some, final somebody score. fell on her leg early in the game and it did not look good um so i didn't i didn't get a chance later to catch up on that 
but uh, she's really playing well freshman, yeah. so hopefully keep an eye on her. Everything is okay with her. All right, well, uh, that's going to do it for the podcast this week. Uh, enjoy the game this Saturday, Lane Stadium. Uh, it's going to be fun. 7-3 and three Pitt, 7-3 and three Virginia Tech with Coastal on the line. That's going to do it for this edition of the Tech Sideline Podcast for our fantastic producer behind the scenes, Malcolm Stewart, on the podcast set, our managing editor, Chris Coleman, our founder and head honcho, Will Stewart. I'm your podcast host, Evan Hughes, saying so long. Enjoy the game this week, and we'll talk to you next week right here on the Tech Sideline Podcast presented by the Fisher Law Firm.